Speaking of James Cameron, another person closely familiar with the Titanic is the director, James Cameron himself, uh, along with his Oscar-winning movie. Um, Mr. Cameron, I understand you've made a number of dives to the wreckage site, too. Just give us your sense on what you're feeling right now, looking at these images of the shipwreck that you studied so closely, and now hearing that another tragedy has been tied to the same area. Well, I've been down there many times, and I know the wreck site very well, as, as does my friend uh, Bob Ballard. I've been made 33 dives. I actually calculated that I've spent more time on the ship than the captain did back in the day. Um, and of course, uh, you know, as a submersible designer myself, I designed and built a sub to go to the deepest place in the ocean, three times deeper than Titanic. So I understand the the engineering problems associated with with building this type of type of vehicle and all the safety protocols that you have to go through. And uh, I think the, that what Bob said because I was watching, uh, is absolutely critical for people to, to really get the, the, the take home message from this, from, from our effort here, is deep submergence diving is a mature art. From the early 60s where there were, you know, a few accidents, nobody was killed in the, in the deep submergence, until now is more time than between Kitty Hawk and the, lo and the, the flight of the first 747. So if we haven't improved over that period of time, and you know we, we have improved drastically over that period of time, and uh, the the uh, certification protocols that all other deep submergence vehicles, except this one, that carry passengers, especially paying passengers, all over the world in tropical waters, uh, deep coral reefs, other wreck sites, and so on, um, the the safety record is is the gold standard, absolutely. Not only no fatalities, but no major incidents requiring all of these assets to converge to a site. Of course, that's the nightmare that we've all lived with, you know, since uh, since all of us entered this this um, this field of deep exploration. We live with it in the back of our minds, but because implosion, as Bob described it, such a violent event, um, is first and foremost in our minds the pressure boundary, which is what they call the the hull of the sub that the people go inside is obviously first and foremost in our minds as engineers. And we spend so much time and energy on that. And we use all the computerized tools available today, finite element analysis. Uh, we worked on our sphere for our, for our deep, deep vehicle that went to the Challenger Deep for over three years, just in the computer before we even made the thing. And then of course we, we pressure tested it over and over and over uh, and so on. So, you know, this is a mature art, and many people in the community were very concerned about this sub. And a number of, of uh, you know, of the top players in the, in the uh, deep submergence engineering community even wrote letters to the company saying that what they were doing was too experimental to carry passengers and that needed to be certified and, and so on. So I'm, I'm struck by the similarity of the Titanic disaster itself where the captain was repeatedly warned about ice ahead of his ship, and yet he steamed at full speed into an ice field on a moonless night, and many people died as a result. And for a very similar tragedy where warnings went unheeded to take place at the same exact site, with all the diving that's going on all around the world, uh, I, I think it's just astonishing. It's really quite surreal, and of course, P.H. PH Nargelet, uh, the French legendary submersible dive uh, pilot, a friend of mine. You know, it's a very small community. I've known P.H. for 25 years. Uh, for him to have died tragically in this way is, is almost impossible for me to process. It is certainly haunting to consider that comparison to the Titanic and what happened to the five people on board this uh, submersible vehicle. James, I want to ask you, though, since, since you've been down on these dive missions before, um, we talked about the safety risks. We've reported on the fact that the people on board signed waivers. They, they knew that this was dangerous and that there weren't very many other vehicles that could come get them out if something goes wrong. Um, how aware were you of those concerns and those risks before you went down? And is, is there anything that should be done um, when it comes to safety in the future? 
Look, it, it's, it's comparing apples and oranges here. I went with a very proven system uh, when I dove at Titanic with the Russian submersibles. They, had, they, were, they used very, very well understood uh, uh, design methodologies and they had an excellent operating record when I, when I dove with them and they continued to have an excellent operating record, a uh, flawless operating record throughout their, their entire career. They're, I think they're now retired uh, but I always had great confidence. Now, the, having said that, I always had confidence in the sub. The Titanic wreck site is a very hostile place. It's a dangerous site to dive. If you think of a typical research dive, you go down and you're really just operating over a bottom. You may be looking for organisms. You may be looking at geology. Hydrothermal vent sites can be, can be a bit dangerous as well. But Titanic, you've got, you know, this eight-story, ten-story high structure with overhanging uh, metal uh, structures, it, it's a twisted mess, you can get entangled. And entanglement was always a concern of ours, but we dove with a two-sub system. We always felt confident that if one of the subs got ensnared, uh, you'd still have communication, you'd still have life support, you'd still have power, you'd have another sub there that could help you manage the problem. We always felt that, that uh, we, were, we were on pretty safe ground. This sub had no backup. It didn't have a lot of backup systems, from what I understand, and it was predicated on, on what I think of as a fundamentally flawed uh, design principle, which is a carbon fiber hull, which when I first heard about a move toward uh, composite hulls, and this was many years ago, even when I was designing my sub, uh, there was another sub that was in sort of in competition with us to get to the Challenger Deep that was operated by uh, a guy named Chris Welsh, uh, for, for Richard Branson, and they had a composite hull, and I told those guys, I said, I said somebody's going to get killed in that sub or in a sub like it, and the DNA of the Ocean Gate sub was in that sub at the time, you know, two hemispherical end caps and a carbon fiber cylinder in the center, and I never believed in that because the way it fails is it delaminates because it's, you have to have a hull, a pressure hull made out of made out of a, a, a contiguous material like steel um, or like titanium, you know, which is the proven standard or, or like acrylic, you know, I'm, an, I'm, um, um, you know, I have a small equity stake in, a, in I think one of the best submersible companies in the world, uh, Triton Submersibles, and they use acrylic for their hulls. But it, once again, it's a contiguous material. So you can do computer modeling to see how it'll behave. But, you know, this Ocean Gate sub had sensors on the inside of the hull to give them a warning when it was starting to crack. And I think if that's your idea of safety, then you're doing it wrong. You don't, you don't, and, and they probably had warning that their hull was starting to delaminate and, to and your, starting to crack. Because to, as, as Bob pointed out, it's our belief, we understand from inside the community, that they had dropped their ascent weights and they were coming up trying to manage an emergency. And to your point, a warning only goes so far when you have the ability um, to get back to the surface or there's a backup vehicle there to come help you out of a bad situation.